Hello everybody, this is Jack the Rambling Raconteur, and I'm here with a discussion of My Phantoms by Theophile Gautier. Uh, I'm probably totally mispronouncing that name. It's translated by Richard Holmes. And this is a selection of short stories uh, he wrote across a period of about 35 years. So the earliest story, The Adolescent, I believe it's The Adolescent, yes, was uh, written when he was like in his very, very early 20s, contemporaneous with um, sort of the start sort of the flourishing of French Romanticism and the idea that, uh, like Victor Hugo was a major writer at that time, Hugo was sort of just bursting onto the uh, French stage uh, with his plays. And so Gautier would arrive in, I wore this uh, Codex Cantina said, hey, more bow ties and jackets, and I was recording an Algebra two lesson. Well, Gautier was famous for his uh, pink and purple uh, waistcoat that he would wear. <laughs> Uh, to these brawls between, you know, theater goers who were supporting Hugo and theater goers who disliked Hugo. Uh, Gautier wrote, you know, the later stories in here are from like the 1860s, I think 1867 is the last story. And yeah, 1867. So there's a real uh, sense of like artistic growth, maturity, metamorphosis uh, throughout the stories. There's seven stories. They all sort of deal with um, ghosts or strange occurrences. Famously, uh, the translator Richard Holmes says, the seven short stories which I have collected for the first time in this little volume are altogether strange. I would hesitate to call them ghost stories, although they certainly contain ghosts. They are more puzzling than that, more human, more genuinely mysterious. Indeed, the whole book is something of a mystery. What I did was I read e uh, one story each night over the past week, and I love them. I had previously read uh, some of Gautier's poetry, so I have this French poetry edition that's like this super enormous anthology, I think like almost 900 pages of poetry. And he's represented along with um, uh, Gerard de Nerval and Victor Hugo in sort of a, a grouping of like sort of French romanticists. Um, and uh, of course, many of the French poets of the 19th century are famous who are later on, the Symbolists, the Parnassians, the Decadents. And uh, Gartier is very much of the generation before that. He uh, yearns for romanticism, he yearns for feeling, but there's not a sense of um, total ennui just overflowing in his writing. And that's what made these stories so interesting is he, he deals with supernatural occurrences. He deals with, in the first story, which was absolutely amazing, a young man is staying at his uncle's house and a, a phantom woman steps out of a tapestry. So it's this tapestry of um, like from the, you know, uh, modeling the Greek period. And this woman steps out of the tapestry in his dreams and like they spend the evening, the nights together and he spends all night awake making love to her and so he's exhausted during the day. And then his uncle realizes what's going on and it's never clear like, was someone actually stepping out of the tapestry? Was he just having these dreams? What's going on? He thinks he sees it later, you know, many years later, and he wants to buy it, but can't. Um, so it's just an absolutely wonderful vignette, so deep in feeling. The, the explosion of color, of sensation, of, of what the uncle's house looked like, it just fills the pages. Um, and even with all that description, you then have this incredibly, like, emotional and passionate scene with, you know, within this dream. Um, the second story is The Priest, and I really liked that one too. Those were probably my two favorites. I really liked The Priest because it, um, it, it really dropped into like gothic horror. So a priest, uh, a young man as he's about to become a priest and accept his orders, sees a woman at, uh, at that uh, church. And he, you know, he looks at her and he has this whole almost like um, Ambrose Bierce's occurrence at Owl Creek, Creek Bridge, like, should I? Should I or should I? Like in a moment, you know, this whole expanse of life could build out and he has all these thoughts about should he just run away and like run with her and leave, you know, the priesthood, but he ends up taking the orders. And then there's a comment about how she's this like notorious harlot. And then he has this dream or is it real life? Is he called uh, to give her this woman the last rites? Is she actually dead? He's visited. He has this entire like Faustian life. Uh, where he lives in Venice, and it's just absolutely extraordinary. Um, the feeling, the emotion underneath all of them. Some of the middle stories, I didn't feel like they, they had quite that same level. The painter was really interesting. 
um, the opium smoker, the, the actors real the actor was absolutely diabolical, literally. It is a like twelve page encapsulation of Faustian questions, questions of like double identity. A young man who wants to be an actor is uh, you know, he plays the role of Mephistopheles in Gareth's Faust, another famous romantic work, and then um, you know, he's told like he's okay, but he's not as diabolical as the actual devil would be. And then is there a night where the devil tries to play the role of Mephistopheles in Faust? And the, the, the descriptions are just wild. They're intensive. Um, the, the, a story that I really liked, and I want to read a quick passage from, was The Tourist, where a character is depicted who almost has this, like, he falls in love with art and wants to, like, marry these, like, women in pieces of art. So he sees the uh, lava, like... Uh, like bas relief almost formed when uh, Pompeii uh, and Herculaneum were overwhelmed by lava and ash and there's like a woman's silhouette built into there almost like a bas relief and so he somehow like tries to transport himself mentally to the week before that happens and who was this woman could he be with her and so I want to read a passage from there he did not seek enough explanation besides how was he himself there he simply accepted her presence as in dreams, one accepts people appearing and acting as if they were alive. Besides, his feelings were too overwhelming to think about with the slightest rationality. As far as he was concerned, the mighty wheel of time had bounced from its groove of years, and his triumphant passion was free to choose its own place among the vanished centuries. He found himself free to face with his own chimera, face to face with his own chimera, the most unobtainable of all, the retrospective ideal, the chimera of the past. In a single moment, his life brimmed over. And then later on, it is faith that creates gods, and it is love that creates women. No one is truly dead until they are no longer loved. Not can nothing, in fact, actually dies. Everything goes on existing, always. No power on earth can be obliterated, can obliterate that which once had being. Every act, every word, every form, every thought falls into the universal ocean of things and produces a circle on its surface which goes on enlarging beyond the furthest bonds of eternity. And I think that just gives you this sense of like feeling that Gartier has. He's, there's these incredible descriptions, these, there's, you know, like mummies discovered, a, a woman's corpse is unearthed, and then, you know, it, it's still astonishingly beautiful. Uh, and so he, he has that, that idea of like my life brimmed over. He brings these characters to these moments, whether in dreams or in life, where their lives seem to just crest and change and climax in every sense of that word and there's just such a metamorphosis and shift and it was they were really passionate the seventh story isn't so much a story as i would really say it works best as an introduction to um Gerard de Nival's writings so this is the penguin classics volume and i'm not a huge fan of uh Nerval. um uh, sylvia is a sort of a precursor to some of the proustian you know, stream of consciousness thought. His poems, The Chimeras, I think, are absolutely haunting and terrifying. Uh, and and he was a close friend of Garfield's. They were like roommates, colleagues. They worked together on journals. And you can tell there's a, a deep sense of, uh, of of sadness. And it's the the story, the poet, is very much an elegy for um, uh, Gerard de Nerval. And so if, if you've ever read de Nerval, I think you would love this set of stories. If you're into um, like Edgar Allan Poe, or I'm trying to think of others, maybe the dream cycle of H.P. Lovecraft, although very different tonally, and there's not the sense of like, you know, crazy deranged racism uh, that you get in Lovecraft, but that sense of like the macabre, that, that just very haunting and strange. If you like um, Willie, Wilkie Collins' Woman in White or The Moonstone, I think you would really enjoy um, my Phantoms. I, I think it, it's a it's an excellent book. I really enjoyed it. I'll you know I'll be rereading it. It's of course, one of those uh, NYRB classics, so it has the beautiful colors. You know, just love these. And then the last connection I would make is when he talks about that idea of like once a form or once a piece of art or once a piece of knowledge has entered humanity, um, can it be lost? And that was very much on the mind of uh, Fichte the German philosopher contemporaneous with Romanticism, sort of a little bit later than Romantics, but 
um, basically contemporaries. So uh, he's represented in German idealist philosophy along with uh, Hegel, Kant, Schelling, um, and he speak to, was sort of had that idea of like, you know, once you produce an idea, it sort of just ripples out. And uh, Gertier uh, put that into a story in a very beautiful way. So those, My Phantoms by Theophile Gartier, uh, highly recommend it. Um, it's a beautiful set of stories uh, and, and just captures what it's like to have dreams and what it's like to, to dream about art, or dream about love. So I hope everybody's safe and well, and I'll be back sometime soon, hopefully, you know, in maybe a different uh, outfit. <laughs> See you later.